Now, okay, so let me start with my presentation. Um, it's boldly called the future of uh, Linux graphics stack, um, the Linux graphics stack. Uh, so maybe the expectations are, are very high. Now, uh, people who know what I'm going to talk about wondered, did you really reserve 60 minutes for it? Uh, so if I survive this one, I can speak on an arbitrary topic for arbitrarily long. Uh, good, let's get started. It's an overview of what we are going through, uh, not so important for you. Just, I'll give a bit of history, explain why the current uh, solutions are not really so good, um, give an overview of things that we considered as a team, and uh, describe what we chose and um, a few words about the current status. And most importantly, I planned quite some time for discussion, so I expect that we will have a discussion. Good. Um, right. So, <laughs> yeah, how did we get here? Um, to understand why uh, there is still a no ideal solution today for uh, making graphics or making video output on the Linux desktop. Uh, in a way, it, uh, why there has never been a year of the Linux desktop and most likely will never be. Uh, we should understand uh, the history of graphics output. So most importantly, Unix is older than graphics. Um, what you can see on the left is, who knows, is a PDP-7. Uh, yeah, right, right, right. Um, <laughs> and yeah, no surprise, it does not have any graphics output. Mind you, it, it, it does have a Type 555 dual deck tape transport, but it does not have any graphics. And Consequently, uh, the original Unix kernel did have support in the kernel for tape drives, uh, which it still has. So you can attach a tape drive and you can use those uh, funny commands like MT uh, or RMT if you know the difference. Um, but there was no need for any graphics, so there was none. And yeah, uh, graphics came a lot later, and uh, yeah, the, dif the audience was a bit different anyway, so you would not expect to run Unix on, on this uh, arcade machine. <laughs> All right. And yeah, um, sometime later, uh, Unix was ported uh, to machines which did have a graphics um, output. <laughs> uh, I could not call it a graphics card because it was integrated first and um, it, 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 it did not resemble what we have today anyway. And there was no support in the kernel. No one needed support in the kernel. Uh, maybe a very basic console for booting the thing so that you could see uh, some diagnostic messages, but no, not, not really graphics. No one was interested. Um, so if you wanted to get some graphics, um, you would have to manipulate the hardware registers and video RAM, if there was video RAM, um, from user space. Yeah, if you didn't have kernel support, you had no other choice, uh, which, need, which means you, you, you need a privileged process. Um, you can't really share the devices. Um, yeah, pretty much there, there can be only one such privileged process. And most importantly, each program must include its own copy of the, of the graphics drivers. Yeah, maybe as a, as a library, but you know, like there were no shared libraries anyway. So yeah, okay. Library does not really mean make much difference. Um, in this situation, uh, the X window system was a big step forward. Like, yeah, uh, suddenly you had only one process uh, which, uh, which dealt with all these ugly details. Um, and you had only one set of drivers 
Uh, for example, it made a lot of sense to maintain the graphics drivers with the Xorg server because the Xorg server, uh, was, sorry, not Xorg, uh, X Windows uh, system, it was not called Xorg at that time, um, because it was ported to many different systems, like uh, it was even ported to, to MS DOS uh, on an IBM PC80. Yeah, it was. Uh, one, one official release of the, of the X server was uh, ported to, uh, to MS-DOS. I think it was X3 or something. Um, <clears throat> X11 or R3. Um, anyway, and the only other option was, 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 was an X step. Um, anyone can recall what that was? Okay, never mind. Um, it, was, uh, it was the predecessor of the Mac OS. So it was, yeah, kind of, sorry, but... Yeah, the thing that was integrated with the kernel. So you had a Mac-based microkernel, and part of that operating system itself was a graphical user interface. Um, so all right, not pure, pure Unix. It did use some Unix, uh, but, uh, but um, was a separate thing. So you could not use it for a different Unix variant. It was bound to the Mac microkernel. Um, good. Um, so what's wrong with X? Now, everyone knows that X is wrong, but um, few people know what's wrong uh, with X. So I'll start with what's good. <laughs> um, it provides this abstraction from specific hardware. So you have some uh, high-level uh, protocol requests that will work regardless of what the underlying hardware um, can do. Um, it also... Um, unifies input devices, um, although we needed a few atoms to get it right, um, almost right. Um, it provides the client-server model, um, very important. It was very important for, for, the, for the first application of the X. It provides network transparency, which was also very important at that time because uh, um, you had different machines and you wanted to work on them remotely because those which had a graphics console did not necessarily have a CPU power. Um, um, you have one set, okay, I, I have already mentioned this one. Uh, it's not bound to one desktop environment. Uh, unlike the Mac OS, you can just run any desktop environment. It's very basic. The, the X server provides the primitives. And uh, today, one of the good things about, um, about the X server is it has become an industry standard. So if you install just about any Unix variant, you will find some sort of X server on it. Okay, so what's bad is compatibility. <laughs> it was designed in the 1980s, and, and it never changed. Um, yeah, so it was extended, but it, it, it never really changed. The design decisions uh, were never reviewed. And now if you look at it, uh, the, 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 the development pace has gone down. I mean, okay, you, you can already see that uh, the intervals grow, but uh, that's not the whole picture. Uh, the first interval is between X1 and X10 which took one year, and um, here you only talk about a minor revision. Yeah? So like, this is X11, and then you have revision, revision 6 and revision 7, 0, and there is no big difference between 6 and 7. It was mostly a source code cleanup, uh, like, or source code uh, reorganization. And since 2012, uh, there has been R7.7 .7 and nothing. Uh, it's 2018 now. Uh, if we kept the original pace, we would have something like X100. Um, <laughs> okay, t you, you got the microphone. Okay, but between six and seven, there was a, a big difference because six was still from the old X work. Uh, it was the consortium um, sample release. And seven was when X386 was merged into the sample release. I should know because I released seven. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yes, you're right. Because yeah. Um, okay. I cheated a bit because this mixes up uh, the official releases of the X consortium and X386, which was developed in parallel in, in this time frame. Uh, yeah. So thanks for the correction. Uh, it does not really 
make big difference. The, 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 the uh, changes happen between uh, R6 and R6.8, uh, 6.9. Mind you, the 7.0 was also released ex as uh, X11 R6.9. And it's the same code base, just built differently. The 6.9 is built with iMake file and uh, 7.0 with auto tools. That's the biggest difference. It does not really change much in the protocol on, or the interface. <laughs> okay. Um, good. Um, let me just give some examples of, of, of the consequences for today. Um, so um, one design decision was all clients are fully trusted. So if you have, um, if you have a connection to the X server, you can do ever, everything and anything that the X server can do, um, which is not very secure in some, some situations. Um, Oh, the most shameful thing comes, comes next. Screensavers don't work reliably. No, until today. Uh, if you open a menu, uh, the screensaver can't kick in because uh, the menu uh, holds the grab and there, there can be only one grab that's global. Um, <laughs> yeah, and you need the grab for, for menu handling because otherwise you, would, you, you could have race conditions with... Um, mouse movements, uh, clicks, no, click, mouse movement, uh, and uh, release. So you need that grab. Um, okay. Um, another thing is coordinates are 16 bit signed in teachers, uh, which uh, effectively limits the global pixel count to 15 bits. Um, 32,768 pixels um, is still enough. Um, but is becoming a bit tight. So you get close to it if you have six 4K monitors uh, next to each other. And you can do that with AMD. Um, so you, you can still get that, but uh, you're getting very close, um, annoyingly close. And one of the consequences is, uh, can you recall the hyperwall to visualization screen at NASA? That, that big screen over the whole wall can't be driven by the X server because it exceeds the, the global pixel count. <laughs> yeah. um, the server can't utilize more than one CPU core. Uh, it can run on different cores, but it, like, it was single-threaded because, mind you, the PDP, uh, sorry, not the PDP, um, but uh, the, the, um, the Xerox stations did not have more than one CPU, so there was no need to have one, more than one. Um, but it can't take, t it, it, it can't really uh, make use of more than one cores, so it's still single-threaded. Um, and, and it made a lot of sense at that time because if you wanted to get things fast with low latency, the best thing you could do was give as much power to that only CPU that you had in the machine <laughs> so that you get, you get it done fast. Um, and last but not least, some, li no, okay, not last, uh, little used but mandatory protocol features like uh, two-dimensional drawing primitives, XLFD uh, stands for X logical font description. Uh, pseudo color, color maps, that's the thing. And um, if anyone can still recall, if you had a, um, a graphics card which only had um, a limited number of colors that can appear at the same time, and you moved your cursor out of that one window, all colors were wrong because it changed the color map. Um, so you don't need that, you don't use that, but you have to keep it because it's part of the protocol. And yeah, the, the, the last but not least is extension incompatibility. Uh, for example, uh, we needed some uh, atoms to get X input uh, in a way that we like it. And then you can't have, um, you can't have um, several different versions at the same time, uh, which may cause some troubles if, uh, yeah, because you have uh, the negotiated version is per connection, not per client. Uh, so we have, you can have multiple clients per one X server connection, but I, I'm not going into details, but it's causing trouble. It's causing complexity. Yeah. And you can't really get rid of it. <coughs> so next, um, what's wrong with Wayland? <laughs> because that's the new standard. Um, so again, let me start with things that are good. Um, 
um, in a way, uh, Wayland acknowledges what is already happening. So it, uh, the, the developers looked at how the X server is used nowadays by modern desktop environments, and they just said, let's implement only this and forget about all the, all the rest, which is good. Uh, you don't have any legacy. Um, it was designed with modern hardware in mind, and uh, yeah, which is good. You can do a lot of things on the GPU today. Um, it provides low latency. Um, so yes, that was one of the design goals. Um, and it provides security. So um, yeah, which, which, which really means um, different Wayland clients can't really mess up with, uh, one, one, one Wayland client can't mess up with a different one, um, which is also good. What's not so good, um, all clients are untrustworthy. So with, with the X server, we had all clients trusted, which was bad, and now we have all clients untrustworthy, which is also bad, um, because, um, yeah, for example, there is no way to write a universal screencast <laughs> application, simply because um, the Wayland compositor will not allow any client to grab the whole screen, which is, good for most clients, but it also means that you can't, you can't even have it. Um, or a VNC server, um, or you know, pretty, much, pretty much anything that needs access to system-wide things, like uh, frame buffer, or um, setting the hardware uh, properties, like uh, screen resolution. Uh, so you don't have any, any, any way to implement um, a variant of XRender uh, with Wayland. Uh, the protocol itself does not allow it. Um, yeah, um, the next thing is not a design, uh, design flaw, uh, it's rather um, how it was implemented uh, in practice, and that's each desktop environment has their own Wayland compositor. So the, the original idea was you would have Wayland as yeah, the protocol. Um, you would have uh, one compositor, uh, the reference compositor, Weston, and um, desktop environments would be implemented as shell plugin. Um, yeah, as, as um, was that shell plugins? It's called differently, not plugin, whatever. Um, with the, with the Western um, compositor, um, so um, if you and then you could also implement, uh, yeah, a universal VNC uh, plugin for the uh, for the compositor, and you would not have a lot of those downsides I mentioned above. Um, but it did not happen. Um, I believe the main reason is, um, yeah, KDE and GNOME both already had a compositor. Uh, they had the X compositor. Uh, so they were more interested in uh, converting that so that it can also support Wayland protocol, uh, not so much uh, rewriting and starting something from scratch and uh, changing the design and so on. Um, whatever the reasons, uh, the situation is that we have multiple compositors. And every such compositor uh, has to implement its own screenshot uh, mechanisms, uh, VNC, and you name it. So, um, not good. You're reinventing the wheel again and again. Okay, and last but not least, there is no network. Um, it must run on the local machine. I mean, yeah, the question is if we need it, but. If, if, if you ask me what's, what's not so good compared to X, um, you can't use uh, Wayland uh, with a remote client. You can't even if you wanted. Good. So now, um, we had, okay, so I'm, when I realized this, um, I sent around an email uh, asking for possible solutions and I had some proposals on a very high level. The, uh, the trigger for that was uh, the VNC server. So if I 
talk about the VNC server, I say, yeah, the, 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 the main thing we wanted to avoid was maintaining three or four or a dozen different uh, VNC server implementations, each with its own bugs and uh, each with its own configuration, mind you. So uh, you, you believe you configured your VNC server, but sorry, no, that was the wrong one. Uh, you configured the GNOME VNC server and you're using KD, so it does not work. Um, but we, we didn't want to go that rat hole. And so I proposed um, a, few, uh, a few options. Um, option one was, yeah, Let's just say Wayland is not the way to go. Uh, is there a way to improve the X window system? And it turns out, yeah, theoretically there is, um, but there are some flaws in the X protocol itself, uh, which means uh, you can't really fix it with keeping the X11. Okay, I said, right, so. Why not? Okay, if, if the X11 ha is, has aged and must be replaced, what about X12? Well, actually, uh, there is already a proposal for X12. Uh, there is a wiki page on X.org. Um, the wiki page was written something like uh, five years ago, and uh, nothing happens. <laughs> so uh, that pretty much explains it. Um, I believe the main blockers are if you really wanted to have an X12, uh, then it would again uh, aspire for becoming an industry standard all around the place. So you would have to, to find consensus among very many parties. Many of them are not really relevant in the business uh, nowadays, but you would still have to talk to them. And uh, even if you do that, it must necessarily break compatibility with legacy software. Uh, now, this is the main advantage of the X protocol the, today. You have a lot of <laughs> applications that were written for the X window uh, system and uh, they continue to work. Yeah, like you had a binary, a, a proprietary piece of software, mind you. Uh, the sources may not even be available any longer. And it continues to work, um, so you're using the X window system. Um, but if you implement X12, they will stop working. Or you would have to provide a compatibility layer, uh, which is no different from Wayland. So, yeah. In fact, if you look at it, Wayland is the X12 without all the heavy lifting. So they did, not, they, they did not go for the X name, but in fact, uh, uh, X12 is, is, is what's called Wayland today, um, with a grain of salt. <laughs> so no, um, that's not an option. Option two was improve Wayland. Hmm. Uh, so the problem is that system-wide operations like uh, screen resolution orientation, uh, refresh frequency, and all of that stuff is only, an, only available to the compositor. Uh, the reason is the compositor is the only process which has uh, direct access to the hardware itself. So it's, it's, it's the process which opens the DR, DRM device node, and no other process can open it after that because, yeah, it's just blocked by the kernel. Um, Right, and the, the, the Wayland developers believe that um, all these uh, operations should be done with private extensions um, to the Wayland protocol uh, or outside Wayland, uh, like you have a DBus interface to do that. Um, so, and in fact, both methods are used. Uh, the private extensions are used by KDE, and uh, the the, the bus thing is used by GNOME. So, um, yeah, um, to sum it up, there is no universal method today. Um, Wayland community is not interested in defining one. Um, so, uh, for for example, you, you could you could overcome a few of the limitations if you uh, if you distinguish among uh, different clients. So uh, today all clients are created equal. You could say no, some of them are more equal, uh, but no, they didn't want to complicate the code with, uh, with a concept of privileges and 
okay, whatever. Um, it's quite unlikely that we could get our improvements accepted because uh, the core Wayland developers would probably regard them as uh, making it worse, not better. So I said, yeah, if there is no other option, maybe we could improve Wayland. Um, as it is, um, let's just look, look further. So we had an option three, uh, start a new project. Now, um, yeah, obviously I'm not talking about starting yet another Wayland. Uh, we know how Mer ended and they had a much bigger team than I can ever have. Um, so no, I looked at different options. Uh, so like abstraction of all, or at least all major solutions. Um, the yeah, the advantage is that would be completely optional. You not you don't need any changes in existing systems. So essentially, what I'm talking about is um, we would provide a kind of um, library or um, yeah, some kind of software uh, which uh, which uh, translates some high level uh, representation of the settings and and stuff. Um, into uh, the implementation of yeah, GNOME or KDE. So you would, uh, you would have one, um, like, one API, like, like you have WX Windows, for example, uh, which is cross-platform, which yeah, is the main disadvantage. Uh, we would have to maintain it. So whenever one of the upstream projects, okay. So, so, so basically like Libvirt does. Yeah, like Libvirt, you have the same like, level of usefulness and ugliness as Libvirt is. Ex exactly. Yes. Uh, and if if anyone comes with a new implementation, you don't you 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 don't have any support for it. Uh, you would have to write it first, maintain, and you get the lowest common den denominator of all the available features. Um, or you would have to complicate your client program so that it can find uh, the extra features that are available with only some backends. Uh, not very appealing. So, um, yeah, the second approach was replace the existing solutions with a standard protocol and library. I call it the font config approach. So um, essentially, you don't, the, the, the XLFD uh, disaster was never really, uh, really solved. Mind you, uh, the X protocol was not, was not improved. Uh, what they did is, was like, instead of using that, all applications should use font config. And font config is, is completely client side. The, the, the only reason you have a single configuration of font config is that all applications are linked against exactly the same font config library, um, which is good enough. If you, if you think about it, it works. Um, I think it will not work here. Um, the, the reason font config could become the standard solution for everybody was that everybody was having the same issue. They were painfully aware of the issue. So when somebody provided um, an easy solution, um, people were happy to adopt it. <laughs> but here, uh, the situation is different because, uh, yeah, um, most uh, most uh, developers believe that it actually works nicely with Wayland. <laughs> there is no problem. Uh, so if, what, what are you trying to solve? Um, it's just a small niche for people who need remote access, um, which incidentally is to the customers. So that's why we are interested. Um, and desktop environments have already started something, so they would have to ditch whatever ha they have already done. And last but not least, there is a technical question. Um, should that use C or C++? Because, you know, the GNOME folks believe in C, even in 2018. And KD folks uh, wrote everything in C++. So, yeah, my... And you would have to provide uh, C++ wrappers and, you know, it's a, bit, it's a small thing, but it adds up to the picture that I'm, I, I, don't really, I don't really want to try it out. And the third option was, okay, um, so the, the main problem is uh, the compositor uh, controls the hardware and does not let any, anyone else uh, do anything with it. 
So what, we could add a layer between uh, the compositor and the hardware, which is called a system compositor. Uh, the idea is not new at all. Uh, it's in fact described in okay. Let me just. Uh, it's in fact described in the original Wayland white paper already. Um, so I let me just quote it: A system compositor can run from early boot until shutdown. It effectively replaces the kernel VT system and can tie in with the system's graphical boot setup and multi-seat support. A system compositor can host different types of session compositors and let us switch between multiple sessions, which is called fast user switching or secure personal desktop switching. So you could have a secure desktop. Um, there has not yet been a serious attempt at implementing one. Now, there has been an attempt to start something uh, with a session compositor, uh, and it, it did not really uh, get far. Um, so I would say no one has seriously tried it yet. Um, now, to illustrate what I mean with, with all this uh, work, uh, let me just show it. Hopefully, it will work. Um, I believe anyone who looked at uh, Wayland knows this picture. Yeah? So uh, it, it, it describes the data flow uh, from user input to user visible output. So it all starts with, with some hardware, which is not shown here. Uh, but uh, the kernel has the AvDev uh, interface, uh, which is read by the Wayland compositor. It sends that as a kind of event to the Wayland client. Uh, the Wayland client decides on the reaction. And if it requires some uh, visible change on screen, uh, it will send another request to the Wayland compositor. And uh, the, the compositor then talks to the DRM. So you have just one, two, three, four. Um, what we are trying to do here is change that picture slightly. Uh, like, okay, so let's see if... Okay, so um, we split the Wayland compositor into session compositor and a system compositor. Uh, add, yeah, which necessarily means we have to add one, uh, one path here. Um, but interestingly, we probably don't have to uh, add one more path here. The session compositor can still tie directly uh, to the input. Um, the reason is uh, we don't really need much input. And second, uh, the AvDev interface allows multiple clients, so you can open it from different programs. Uh, should I should I let the animation once more so that you can see that. No, okay, the, the reason is, is it, it took me quite some time uh, to get it done within. <laughs> but yeah, so here we go. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but the other thing is, okay, thank you. Um, you can have multiple session compositors. And so you can have the original one, but you can also have another one. So this one could be GNOME, this could be KDE, and they are both active. Obviously, only one of them can be shown on a single screen uh, at any given time, uh, but they can be running concurrently, uh, which is good. Uh, I'll get to that later uh, or in, a, in a few seconds. So what are the cool things? Um, one of the cool things is now we would have one place uh, to rule all hardware configuration, uh, like things like monitor relative position, like which is left off, uh, uh, above, underneath, um, uh, okay, uh, resolution, orientation. So, for example, you, we, we could avoid these rotated uh, encrypted disk password entry dialogues while booting. Yeah, so uh, if you turn your monitor 90 degrees, uh, usually you get that, yeah, 90 degrees. <laughs> it can be fixed, uh, or at least sometimes it can be fixed, uh, but you would have to change the configuration in X server or Wayland, depending on which desktop environment you're using. Um, 
Um, and then you would also have to change it independently for the, uh, for the Plymouth uh, um, boot screen. So now we would have one. Uh, one implementation of system-wide services. So, uh, yeah, because uh, the system compositor is now the thing which talks to the hardware, it necessarily also knows what is going to the hardware, and it can, uh, so it can intercept uh, the frames, and you can implement VNC in this system compositor. Uh, and screen snapshots, and recording, and screencasting, and uh, you name it. Um, it controls all video resources from boot to shutdown. So you could make a real transition from the boot screen to the login screen and uh, without any race conditions. Uh, so there is one race condition between uh, Plymouth and uh, the display managers, uh, which can't be resolved because it's on the kernel level. I will not go into details. If, if you really want, I'll, I'll dig out the, the bug number and give it to you. Um, can't be really fixed. Um, okay, we could also have improved session handling. What I mean is, um, yeah, uh, we could have session transitions, like... Um, if you have multiple sessions, like shown in the, in the uh, previous slide, uh, you can make yeah, some eye candy transition between them. Uh, you could even have a graphical session manager with previews, like live previews of all the running sessions, and you just click with a, with a mouse and uh, choose one. But that's okay, that's, that's eye candy. Um, now, you could have headless sessions. Uh, which is good. So uh, what I mean is uh, you can start a session locally and then uh, as you go, go home, uh, you don't terminate that session, but instead just disconnect it from the display and another user can log in and you can connect to the remote headless, uh, to the headless session remotely, uh, for example, with VNC or a different protocol if you, if you hate the VNC. Um, and... Well, when you return on the next day, uh, if this is a multi-seat machine, you could reattach that running session to different output. And all works. <laughs> Not easily possible today. Um, right. Oh, and one thing is, on the previous slide, it always said session compositor, uh, which somehow uh, sounds like we are excluding uh, the good old X.org. Uh, no. In fact, it is possible to write XORG drivers uh, that talk to the system compositor instead of uh, the hardware. So you could run uh, the real thing, not an emulation, the real thing uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, its own desktop environment and everything um, under the system or above the system compositor. Okay, um, good. Now, all right. Yeah, this is an overview of uh, the external interfaces. Maybe, yeah, it's, it's good to realize that it's, it's a small thing. Yeah, like all it needs is talk to the kernel. So obviously it grabs the DRM. Um, it, probably will have to listen on input uh, to provide hotkeys, like system-wide hotkeys, uh, but that's about it. It has, to talk, it has to listen to UDEF so it can uh, find new monitors as they appear, or new graphics cards, yeah, mind you. You can attach an external graphics card uh, via Type-C connector, and when, then, then when you detach it, everything crashes, all it can t tell you stories. Um, because that's in PCI Express one. So there is no PCI Express hot unplug yet. Um, anyway, back to the presentation. Uh, it, it should talk to LoginD. So we are not trying to replace LoginD. Uh, we are, uh, the, the plan is uh, we would still, uh, we, we would um, build upon uh, the seat management which is already existing. Um, yeah, it, 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 it 
should somehow talk to login managers. Uh, so that's what's, what's called display managers nowadays. But now since the display is act actually taken by the system compositor, it should be called login manager or something like that. That's the thing that, is, that displays the login screen, um, actually logs you in. Uh, it must talk to the session compositor, um, obviously, and then uh, we might have loadable extensions. Um, so, yeah, things like the VNC server does not have to be active. It would be better if it can be loaded only if you need it. Um, eye candy effects, yeah, if you don't need them, if you don't like them, just they don't have to be there, um, and whatever else. Good. Uh, next, um, okay, so this is um, an idea how that should should uh, look from boot to session. So the, ide the idea is um, it would start as early as possible. So probably it should be one of the first processes that gets started by systemd. Um, it should accept a Plymouth connection. So the, the, the idea is just like the xorg, uh, uh, server would be rewritten with drivers that talk to the system compositor instead of the hardware. Plymouth also should be rewritten so that it can talk to, uh, or it can provide output through uh, the system compositor. Um, at some point, you make the transition to a login manager. No, sorry. Um, Login manager starts. Yeah, these are these two steps are separate. This is important. So um, you don't have to wait until um, until uh, the login manager can take uh, the the screen. Uh, you can just start the login manager anytime and let it just create the connection to the system compositor. It starts as a headless uh, headless client, like yeah. Who cares? And uh, it, it creates the greeters later when when you know which greeters you want. Like um, probably you want to log in on all attached screens, but maybe maybe not. So that that is separate now. You can start that independently. Um, then user logs in. Um, and then the desktop environment starts, so you can you can actually keep the login manager running. It's just not it's displayed. It it, it will lose the the uh, the display again, and instead the desktop environment would be shown. And then you have the running sessions. Yeah, I, mean, I, I wrote down there are three different ways of of uh, output during during regular normal operation. Uh, so one is the, the usual desktop rendering, but we could also implement uh, shortcuts for full screen rendering. So if you have full screen rendering, uh, the system compositor can pass down exactly the buffer that it, uh, that it gets from DRM, and uh, the full screen application can draw into, into the frame buffer itself, for example. Okay, uh, did you want to? Okay. Um, and yeah, there's another thing uh, called uh, full screen with low latency. Uh, the system compositor can actually give up uh, its uh, um, DRM device node or uh, lease the device node to a different application. Um, this has already been uh, tested with Xorg um, by Keith Packard. Um, that was needed for VR games. So the, the, the any any uh, abstraction over these uh, VR displays uh, were bad. So we could do the same. The good thing is it would again be configured in one place. Okay, <laughs> so that's the good things. Uh, now, what are the challenges? Um, yeah, the main challenge is get some acceptance in the community. As I already mentioned, uh, the community now believes that Wayland works just fine. <laughs> and uh, the uh, desktop environment uh, developers uh, find that as a conflict with their current plans. So they already have some plans how to address the question, the, 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 yeah, the, the deficiencies that I described above. And uh, if we come up with a, with a completely different solution, yeah, we will have to persuade them that it, it pays off. 
Um, so we'll need some kind of yeah promotion in the community. <laughs> so, but let's see. It's 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 personally it's my it's my uh, main concern because Susie is um, is famous for creating technically superior uh, solutions that never gain any. Uh, and attention in the community. So we, we end up being the only ones using it. And after a few years, we abandon that solution again because Red Hat is doing it differently. Um, so I don't want to go that, that way once again. Um, right. Yeah, uh, another challenge is promotion of a standard way to change system settings. So um, I, I, I mentioned uh, we could do this and define a way to uh, change screen resolution, rotation, and so on. Um, and we would probably go the way of defining private extensions to the Wayland protocol. Um, problem is, um, why should anyone uh, take ours instead of anything else? So we should we should be able to um, design it properly from the startup, and then we should defend it. Or yeah, but that's a challenge. Um, another challenge is uh, the system compositor becomes another single point of failure. So if there is a bug in the system compositor and it crashes, then all running sessions crash with it. Um, yeah. Not sure if 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 if, if there's um, a way to avoid it, but yeah, at least we could write it in a way that it, it can uh, mostly recover from a, from a crash, like restart uh, while keeping the existing connections. I don't know, um, but yes, there might be some um, opposition because you're adding one more piece which can fail. Um, another challenge is, is size. Uh, as I mentioned, it should be uh, active from early boot, which means it, it must go in the init RD. Um, so we, we, we must keep the size as low as possible. Not because of SUSE. The SUSE init RD is so huge already that it does, it, it does not really make much difference, but there are other distributions. So we are trying to achieve some acceptance uh, with other distributions. and. Some distributions really look at init RD size, so we should try to keep it small. Um, and another challenge is, yeah, um, on that nice diagram, uh, we added one path from the session compositor to the system compositor, which does increase uh, the latency, at least for page flip. Uh, maybe we can avoid it in most other cases, but the page flip uh, has to go through one more process. That's the goal of it. You want one process which uh, which can uh, which knows that there is a page flip. Um, in my opinion, uh, there are still circumstances where this is a no-go, but in most uh, cases, uh, it's not the latency which uh, which is bad and user experience or perception. Um, uh, it's more, more important uh, that we don't introduce delay variation, uh, also called jitter. So the jitter would be worse than the delay itself. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, I can imagine it can, it can, it can uh, spark some flame wars. And yeah, there are also some open questions. <laughs> So this is not decided. One is, uh, do we even need a global configuration file? I mean, theoretically, each UDEV uh, output has its, sorry, each output has its uh, UDEV object, so we could just use uh, UDEV uh, properties and configure it with uh, UDEV configuration files. Um, I know that we do that for some uh, configurations. I don't know, so I'm, I'm not decided. Uh, another open question is if we should replace the kernel VT mechanism by graphics-based consoles, which is possible. So you don't, you don't need to maintain the, uh, the in-kernel consoles. You could just run um, a DRM-based uh, console in user space instead, which has some, uh, some advantages like proper Unicode support, but it also has some disadvantages. So I don't know, maybe we want both, or we want to make that configurable. 
Um, another open question is input handling, um, because we need some sort of input handling. Um, not the least because we also need some input handling to implement the VNC protocol. But yeah, we also probably want to listen to kernel uh, input events. Not sure how we want to tackle that. And last but not least, we need an, a, a good project name. It's, it's currently called DSCD, which stands for uh, DRM System Compositor Demon. Should be pronounced Descent. <laughs> Uh, but that's 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 a code name. It's not a real name that I would love that I would like to promote in the community. Um, the contest is running. When I suggest things like Graphit or even like, but yeah, the contest is running. Um, if if you like bike shedding uh, discussions, uh, I will gladly join. So yeah, and that's it. So we have some seven minutes for discussion. Maybe I can leave the, the slide with open questions here so that you get some ideas what can be discussed. Um, so any questions to uh, the plan? Okay, there is one hand in. So first, uh, I'd like to clear out item number two, the VT mechanism graphics-based. Um, please be aware that the text-based console you have on, on x86 is a PC peculi peculiarity, which you don't notice because you're all in the x86 world. But when it was ported to Spark initially, Linux, you only have a graphics console there and various other workstations. So that's a normal thing, and I don't think it's a big issue. So just strike that out. And you <laughs> might, might have a text-based console. If, the, if, you're not, if not, that's not a problem. Um, and on the project name, make sure you have a T at the end, so it is decent and not going downhill. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, right, what you were mentioning, that's actually the, the CGA legacy from, from uh, the PC. Uh, that's why we have a text-based console. But actually, there is so much to say to this um, that I don't really know where to start. But, uh, <laughs> uh, it, so just focusing on one thing, did I understand this right, that on your system compositor you would run different compositors at the same time? So the GNOME compositor and the, the KDE compositor uh, sim simultaneously? Yes. Um, there is, <clears throat> the problem there is, that then GNOME applications and, and, and KDE applications are not aware of each other. And one place where you will notice it pretty much immediately is cut and paste. Have you thought about how to do cut and paste with this? Yeah, that, that's another open question that, that I should add because um, you could either uh, have isolated sessions and then you don't want to implement cut and paste. Um, or you could actually want to have multiple sessions uh, with the same user or different users even that should not be isolated and then you want to implement cut and paste. Um, we would have to modify the, the session compositors anyway. So yeah, maybe make it configurable. Essentially, it's the same question as should cut and paste work um, <clears throat> from a virtual machine? Some people want it, some people don't want it because, yeah, isolation uh, or convenience depends on, on the use case. Well, okay. um, it's obviously a non starter if, if you need different sessions for different applications that you want to, I know, I don't know, if you, if I want to run DigiCam on a GNOME desktop, right, just because that's the application I use. Uh, so, that, so it must be possible, of course, to run $foo applications in a dollar bar session. Oh, it is. Mm -hmm. Surely you can right, do that. So, and and then copy and paste must work, of course. Uh, inside the session, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. I, I thought uh, the question was if, if you can cut and paste across sessions. Yeah, that's something different to decide. That's true. But I think that's not so important anymore. I, the important thing is that within one session it works. Um, Michael had a question. 
the, in the back, just yeah. catch the cube. Too, so if I can ask first. Or, yeah. Or, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. You, you, Do you, you run on Wayland yourself, is the one question. Right now, not yet. Uh, yeah. And will ever Wayland work with Plasma Compositor? Because there are many reports that it doesn't simply work. Um, it, yeah, it, the, the support in, in the Plasma Compositor is still early stages, but it, yeah, the, the, the KD community believes it will. Ah, okay. Do you have any estimation? Um, <laughs> not sure. Okay, thank you. In, in the back. It stopped working, yeah. This one? Yeah, that's better. Uh, so there's uh, the no, cut and no. paste. No, no, this works. Okay. Who's works? Speak this louder. There is the cut and paste thing. Uh, Valent actually has a protocol for that. So it should be possible to solve. Uh, but the other thing is, uh, you mentioned security as a advantage of Wayland, uh, but if there is any kind of security in Wayland, it's just incidental. Security is one thing uh, the Wayland uh, people are not interested in at all. Uh, so if incidentally application cannot access uh, each other's buffer, that's because the way the buffers are rendered, only the compositor has access to them. But for example, in some uh, yearly demo of Wayland, uh, you know XIs, that uh, spyware application that uh, looks at the place where you have the mouse pointer. There was a demo of this very same spyware application uh, implemented uh, natively in Wayland, because input is not secure, because they aren't imp interested in security. Uh, so that's it, no security at all. Okay. Um, I. Uh, yeah, and there is another example, uh, uh, Screensaver. They develop, uh, they, they designed protocol for uh, uh, Screensaver disabling, and like Xscreensaver implements uh, this uh, uh, in a way that uh, the application cannot break the system because uh, it can uh, only ping the Xscreensaver uh, to disable uh, screen saving uh, for a certain time. And uh, if it wants uh, the screen saver to be disabled uh, for a long time, it has to ping uh, several times. Uh, but in Wayland, the application uh, just uh, tells Wayland to disable screen saving, and it's disabled until it tells again to, to enable it. And you never know which application did it. If some. Yeah, I'm not trying to defend that Wayland is ideal. Uh, I'm just saying there are things that can be solved with the community, and then there are things that the community will probably not accept, um, like access to the frame buffer. Um, that has been tried already. I think you should pursue the X12 idea. I, I think it would be much better than, than fixing the crap that is Wayland. It's really, I don't think they are sensible in their design decisions, what they made. It's not at all, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the basic problem of Wayland is it was designed with basically one goal in mind, and this is was to reduce the number of round trips you had with the compositor uh, on, on X. Because on X, if you follow uh, um, a mouse click from the input from the input driver uh, until something happens on the screen. You will see that it goes back and forth through the X server all the time until it finally uh, creates some changes in pixels on the screen. And to reduce this, uh, the Wayland protocol was was created. And uh, of course, it was not the solution to all the things that you needed. It was just uh, there to solve this one thing. And over time, people discovered that, oh, we can't do this anymore, or we can't do that anymore. Um, how shall we go about this? And then there were things added around Wayland uh, that made it kind of look like a Warthog like X uh, uh, was in the past. 
Um, that's that's the big problem that, that the Whalen people are facing, and I think they're right now starting to realize this. Okay, uh, in, in that case, I'm very pragmatic. Uh, instead of finding the best technical solution, I have somehow acknowledged that it has already sneaked in, even in the OpenSUSE distro, uh, is the default now. And yeah, so let's, let's live with it. Like, um, okay, anyway, there, there was one more question. We are already over time, but. Okay, sorry. So if that's all, thank you for attention. And yeah, see you sometime again. <laughs>